Welcome back to the Humble Marksman channel, the only gun channel here on YouTube dripping with that BDE. That's right, Big Dad Energy. No BDE joke really today, guys. Just know that if it were warmer outside, I would be wearing short shorts with mid-shin length white tube socks. But it's cold, so here we are. I'm David, and today we're going to be talking about USPSA and more specifically getting into USPSA. Now, I used to be a match director and would give this same speech every month at every match that we did. So I'm giving it to you on the internet as you consider your your very first USPSA match. So first and foremost, I want to set your expectation when you come out here. Shooting is one of those things that guys do that they assume that they're good at, but there's very few objective standards that they can look at. So they think they're going to be good on their first time out. Now, USPSA is a game, but it tests skills that you only develop by shooting USPSA. So it's unreasonable to think you're going to come out and win your very first match when you just show up. In fact, Success should be gauged by firing at a minimum the number of shots needed to complete the match and understanding and learning as much as you can about what the game's about. Second, and this is really important, I get more comments on this than anybody, gear is not going to win your match. You don't need the very best equipment, the very best gun, the very best ammo to go out and win your first match. The guy who won production, carry optics and limited this year at nationals was shooting a $600 Canic rival made in Turkey with off the shelf gear that anybody could buy. It's not specialized stuff. He's just a better shooter than everybody else. And he won the game. Good equipment helps, but it's not required. There's a good chance that the equipment that you have is good enough in order to come and participate right now. So getting started, registering for the match, practicescore.com basically hosts all USPSA match signups across the country. You can search for your area and see where the matches are. They're usually going to be on the same Saturday or Sunday of the month every month. So it'd be like first Sunday, second Sunday, whatever it is. And as far as divisions are concerned, there are basically four divisions at this point. Your choices are if you have a standard gun that is not single action only, doesn't have a compensator and doesn't have a magwell, but has a slide ride red dot that is a carry optics gun. If you have have an iron sight gun and you can basically do whatever you want to Mr. Iron Sight gun and use 140 millimeter magazines stuffing them all the way full then you have a limited gun and if it's a nine millimeter go ahead and register for a limited minor do not sign up for production even if you think that you want to compete in production production requires so many reloads and the stages are so long for high cap shooters these days that it's just not as conducive to learning like you can end up in production eventually but start with limited in your first match if you want to shoot irons. Open division is purebred race guns. These guns are amazing. They are shooting really, really spicy ammo. They throw a lot of smoke. They're super duper loud. This is probably not where you're going to start. This is where some folks end up, but it's a lot of money and a lot of time, but it's also a lot of fun. And finally, there is pistol caliber carbine or PCC. How much ammo do you need to take to your first match? Now, there's some easy math that you can do. If you take 32 and multiply it by the number of stages in the match, that's going to be probably a good example of how much ammo at a minimum you should bring, but that's going to be a weird number. So just round up to the next increment of 50 or 100. So most local matches run six stages. That's about 180 something rounds. And so round up to 200 rounds, 200 rounds will get you through most local matches. Now, every range that's hosting USPSA matches operates as a cold range. What that means is that everybody's guns are going to be in their holsters with the hammer down, no magazine in, completely unloaded. There will be designated safe areas for you to put your gun on and all that kind of stuff. And the way the cold range rule basically works is you're only allowed to handle your gun when you have the direct supervision of a range officer. And you will know you have the direct supervision of that range officer when he gives you range commands of make ready. That's your cue that you have his attention and you can handle the gun, but you're only going to get that as a shooter. The other area on the range where you can handle the gun without direct supervision is going to be the safe area. In the safe area, you can handle guns, but you cannot handle ammunition. And handling ammunition does mean taking your belt on and off. Uh, if you have the gun in the holster on your belt and take your entire belt off, that counts as handling the gun as well. So leave your belt on or go to the safe area, take your gun out of the belt, put it in a pistol rug. And that's a piece of equipment you probably do need to show up to the range with is a pistol rug. They're like 15 bucks. I'll put a link to one on Amazon. Only handle guns in the safe area or under the direct supervision of a range officer. That said, loading 
ammunition into magazines. You can pretty much do that on everywhere on the range except for in the safe area. If you handle ammunition in a safe area, it's a disqualifiable offense. If you handle guns anywhere outside the safe area or without the direct supervision of a range officer, that is a disqualifiable offense. So let's talk about the match flow and then we'll get into kind of scoring and all that kind of stuff. So most of the time you're not going to be the new shooter. In most good clubs will start you at the bottom of the list in the shooting order on your first stage. And if they don't, it is completely within the realm of the possible. Like if you have a last name that starts with A, B, or C, and you're the first shooter, you can say, hey, this is my first match. Can you bump me down? I want to see what kind of goes on here. That's totally reasonable to do, and they should accommodate you in that. So what happens in USPSA is each stage is run by two range officers. There is going to be the main range officer who's holding the timer, and there's going to be a second range officer who is holding the tablet for scoring. The guy holding the clock is going to be watching the shooter's finger placement, their muzzle direction, and just general safety stuff to prevent them from doing anything unsafe. The second range officer's job is to watch their feet, count the number of shots, things like that, and it's just a second set of eyes to make sure that the muzzle stays pointed downrange. The way it goes is this. There's going to be somebody who's the shooter, and almost universally these are used across the country everywhere I've been. There is the shooter, there is the next shooter who is on deck, there is the next shooter who is in the hole, and the shooter after that is in the deep hole. So your job as a competitor when you're not shooting is to help score and pace targets. We're going to give you these patches, we're going to ask that you cover up the holes in the targets, and you're only going to do that after they score the target. Do not get in front of the RO. But a good piece of advice is remember the hits on every target that you patch. In case there's any question, even though they've scored it, you'll know what the hits were that you covered. And you're going to help reset, steal, and patch, and all that until you hear your name as the in-the-hole shooter. At that point, you stop being a resetter and start getting ready to shoot. So as discussed, you can only handle a gun once the RO issues the make ready command. USPSA has a number of different start positions. They can be hands relaxed to the sides, wrists above shoulders, hands touching marks, toes touching marks, holding some weird prop, like there can be almost anything. So at the make ready command, that is your time to get ready to shoot. What that means is you can take sight pictures, you can dry fire, you can do a dry draw if you want, you can do all that stuff. Generally speaking, it's a common courtesy to keep your make ready of about 30 seconds, 30 seconds to maybe 45 seconds. You'll see some guys who have very long make readies and a lot of people make fun of them of it constantly. And I encourage you to do that as well as a new shooter. So once you have the make ready command and you are the shooter, there's a couple things you need to know moving around the shooting area. The shooting area is defined usually by two by fours that are nailed into the ground and painted some color. And that is the area within you have to shoot. As you advance down range, there's an invisible 180 line that moves with you that stays parallel to the back berm. So if I'm right here, on the range, my muzzle cannot cr come up range of my hands right here. If the muzzle crosses this plane, then I have disqualified myself. And that's something to keep in mind. If you get disqualified, nobody disqualified you. You disqualified yourself. They just informed you of it. The 180 is the most common rules break that leads to disqualification. And where we really get into trouble with that is anybody who has done like some light law enforcement type training and indexes to position Sewell like this. The problem with position Sewell is if I move to my support side, the muzzle immediately goes up range and I've broken the 180. The other two common ways that people break 180 is navigating barricades as they try and leave windows. Sometimes their gun will hit the barricade and get forced up range or potentially with up range movement, they may not have the gun in the safest place and the muzzle breaks 180. So if you're aware of those kinds of things, you can mitigate them. And the other thing to be aware of is how you keep your finger in the trigger. When you're running around on the range, keep your finger indexed high on the slide like you see here. So an easy way to think about this, if my arms are straight, because I'm taking a sight picture on target, my finger can be bent and on the trigger. But if I'm moving, my arms are bent and my finger goes straight. So, I mean, that's an easy drill that you can do is straight, bent arms, straight finger, straight arms, bent finger, and just doing this over and over again, but it has to be really, really high because we do safety by the buddy system at USPSA. And that includes somebody seeing daylight in your trigger guard. So putting it up over the ejection port like this is generally a better practice, especially keep your finger out of the guard on reloads. So you can do it depending on the range you're at. Some ranges have different rules where you can't have muzzle over the berm reloads and just be aware of what the range rules of where you're at are. But especially when you're seating a mag on a reload, 
the finger cannot be inside the trigger guard. There are no warnings for this. If you do this, you will be disqualified. When you're at home dry firing, you can just basically practice of when you drop your mag like this, straightening your finger and getting it up on the ejection port like we talked about. Another way that you can get disqualified is through a dropped gun. So once you are the shooter and have received the make ready command, if you drop your gun, that's considered unsafe gun handling and it is a disqualifiable offense. The procedure for recovering the gun is the range officer is going to yell stop. And if you hear stop, that means stop what you're doing. It could be because of ammunition. It could be because you did something unsafe, but just listen, when you hear stop, just stop what you're doing. Just finger outside the guard and stand down and wait for further direction. But if you drop a gun, Range officer is going to pick it up. He's going to clear it and put it back in your holster and then tell you what happened. If you are not the shooter and you're just resetting stages, if you hit a prop or a wall or something like that and it dislodges the gun from your holster, this does happen occasionally, but that's why we run a cold range. If that is to happen, do not pick up the gun. Go tell the range officer for the stage, hey, my gun got dislodged on this thing. It's on the ground over there. Can you pretty please go pick it up? I'm sorry. And everybody's going to look at you and they're going to shame you a little bit, but this is this is something that is rare to happen, but it does happen occasionally. USPSA is phenomenally safe with the track record if you consider how many matches that are run every week. And because we use the buddy system on safety and we have basically zero tolerance for infringements on safety rules, it's a very safe sport. But the only way you can get at that safety is listening to your range officers. So as the shooter, you'll be given the make ready command. And that's when you get ready. You start the gun in whatever condition is. Generally, it's going to be loaded and holstered, but sometimes it's placed on the table. So as you get the gun in the ready condition and get yourself in the start position for the stage, you'll then get the indication from the RO, are you ready? Are you ready? Stand by. And there is only one answer to this, and the answer is no. If you assume the ready position, whether the gun is in the correct ready state or not, they're going to issue that command. So be sure that you're paying attention and your gun is set up the way it's supposed to be. Now, if you incorrectly start a stage and the range officer didn't start you in the right position, then it's it has to be a reshoot. That is a failure of the range officer to do his job. You know, people can forget if it's wrists above shoulders, then, you know, somebody will start like hands at sides. And we have to make sure that from a competitive equity standpoint, everybody's doing it the same way. After you get the make ready command, assuming that you stay static for two seconds, you'll get the standby. And from standby, you cannot move anything on your body until the buzzer goes off. At the time of the beep, that's when the clock starts running and it is going to measure the time until your last shot fires. So you'll run around in the shooting area, shooting each target, generally speaking, just a little bit of tip. An alpha Charlie on each target is good enough. Do not make up shots that are Charlies with an alpha. It's generally not worth the time to do it in pretty much all the divisions at this point. Deltas are worth making up and certainly misses or mics as we call them are worth making up as well. So you navigate the shooting area safely and when you are are finished shooting, you will hear the range command from the range officer. If you're finished, unload and show clear. If you are finished, unload and show clear. If clear, hammer down, holster. This is a skill you want to pay attention to. Now, there's going to be plenty of times where I'm pointing at the side berm to finish or potentially pointing at this side berm to finish. When I get the unload and show clear command, immediately what I want to do is square up to the back berm and then begin to unload the gun. Now the procedure for unloading the gun, especially in your first match, is going to be to take the mag out, stow it in your pocket, and rack the round out onto the deck. Obviously be aware of where your muzzle is pointed the entire time that you're doing this. Keep it square to the back berm and just rack the round out like that. Hold the slide open so the RO can look inside and visually inspect your chamber and see that it is empty. Once he observes that it's empty, you'll get the if clear hammer down and holster. And once the slide is back in battery, you're going to pull the trigger on an empty chamber to let the hammer fall, and then you're gonna holster the gun. At the end of the video, we'll have some tips on holstering safely so you don't point the gun at yourself or anybody else. As a PCC shooter, there's really two things that you'll have to have to shoot the match properly. You're gonna have your rifle bag and you're gonna have a chamber flag. As far as loading and unloading PCCs are concerned, generally speaking, uh, it's allowed by the rules, but some clubs have different rules on how you have to load and unload. There's two ways you can take your rifle out of the bag. You can go within two yards of a side berm and uncase the PCC with the chamber flag in, but you cannot do any manipulations, can't take sight pictures. 
you just go muzzle up. Generally, muzzle up is the rule. Sometimes some clubs are muzzle down. Just depends on what the rules are. But muzzle up will usually be the way that you carry a rifle around the range. If they have like a rack or something like that, that may be where you store the PCC. The other option is you can carry your bag to the start position with the RO. And when he gives you the make ready command, that's when you can uncase the PCC. And only during make ready are you allowed to check your optic, you know, do some dry firing, whatever you want to do. Now, remember that 180 rule? Just be aware that navigating a stage with a bunch of barricades and stuff like that isn't the easiest with a PCC. You're going to have to be hyper aware of how that muzzle is pointed and how to move around with it. I would highly encourage you as a PCC shooter to do some dry fire around some barricades and stuff like that. When you first show up to a stage, what's going to happen is the range officer is going to read the stage brief. He's going to tell you the start condition of the gun. He's going to tell you the start position for the shooter. He's going to talk about any kind of scoring issues. And there's two types of scoring. There's Comstock, which you shoot as much as you want. And there's Virginia count, which means that you can only fire the certain number of shots that are specified unless you accept penalties. So range officer is going to read this stage brief. And then the other range officer is going to read the shooting order. That's going to be your opportunity to chime in and say, hey, I'm a new shooter. Can you please bump me down if you need to do that? Generally, there will be a four to five minute stage walkthrough, and that's going to be your chance to investigate the stage, walk around all the shooting areas. And generally what you want to do as a new shooter is you want to first go around and see all the targets and count up the number of shots. Then you're going to make sure you know where all the targets are. Now in the shooting area, find all the positions you have to go to in order to see all the targets. So that's going to be two walkthroughs. First is counting the targets. Second walkthrough is going to be finding the shooting position. Third walkthrough is going to be imagining, and you can actually air gun. You can hold up your pretend gun and pretend to see sight pictures. So go to each of the shooting areas and pretend to see sight pictures on each of the targets where you're going to be engaging from. And remember what that looks like. Fourth pass through you're going to then think about how you want to move and how you're going to reload. As you're focusing on your movements, consider how you're going to do your reload. Most stages will generally have a reload kind of baked in. You're gonna probably want to reload the gun during a long run or potentially it's going to be a standing reload. Workspace reload is generally gonna be okay. You're probably gonna hold the gun somewhere between your sternum and your chin. Some people reload right in front of their face and that's okay too at most ranges. Number one point is to keep that finger out of the guard. Let's talk briefly about scoring. So you're going to see two different types of targets. There is the USPSA target and the IPSC target, which kind of looks like a stop sign. There are three scoring areas on each target. The A zone is worth five points in all divisions. And depending on whether you're shooting factory nine millimeter or you're shooting some Wildcat nine millimeter round or 40 Smith & Wesson, those are major. So C's are gonna count as four points for major, three points for minor, and D's are gonna count as two points for major and one point for minor. So the way scoring works is when the shooter is done, they're gonna record the time and then we're gonna go around and look at all the hits on the targets and that's gonna add up to a number of points. The way hit factor scoring works is you add up all the points and you divide it by the time that it took to shoot the targets and that is your hit factor. You'll hear the term hit factor a lot. So the way hit factors work is everybody's gonna have a hit factor after they shot the stage in their given division. We're gonna take the highest hit factor and he is going to have the 100% score. He is the winner of the stage. Everybody else hit factor is gauged against their hit factor and they're assigned a certain number of stage points or match points is what they're called. So the way you determine match points is the number of rounds it takes to shoot a stage multiplied by five. That's the number of match points available. So you're going to shoot the whole match. They're going to add them all up and whoever has the most match points wins. And you may be thinking that sounds more like an efficiency rating than a like bullseye accuracy rating. And you're absolutely correct. You do not have to shoot all alphas in order to win the match. In fact, you probably won't win the match shooting all alphas. It's good to shoot more alphas than less, but at the same time, if you're taking the time to guarantee two alphas on every target, those points decay with the amount of time it takes to shoot them. Similarly, if you're shooting at steel targets, and most matches will have steel targets, it does not make sense to fire more than about four shots at a target. If you can't get it done in about four shots, then you probably don't have the skill at the match to make it happen. Just accept your miss and move on. A miss is worth minus 10 points. Basically two alphas on another target are completely wiped out. Now there are no shoot targets as well. Those are going to be white targets. If you have a hit on a no shoot target, then that is going to be worth minus 10 points. The way scoring targets works is that the targets are technically impenetrable. You cannot shoot through one target and hit another target and have it count for score. But if there's like a no shoot target on a shoot target and you hit the 
perforation on the no-shoot target, you're going to get both values of score, whatever the scoring target value is, plus the penalty for hitting the no-shoot. Some targets will have black paint on them. This is called hardcover. Hardcover basically means like the shot didn't even happen, so the hits don't count in the black areas of the target. A couple tips to help keep you safe. So first and foremost, if you are using a hip ride holster, which is the most competitive holster setup, that's what most people run, the way to reholster is you're going to kick your hip to the side, drag the gun past the holster and then rotate it down and in. Appendix holsters are now allowed in USPSA, so if that's you, then you're going to kick your hips out, pull your concealment garment out of the way, and you're going to look the gun into the holster very carefully before you assume whatever the start position is. Absolutely no one is going to be impressed with how fast you can holster a gun but you are more likely to make a mistake if you rush the holstering process. So pretty, pretty please be as deliberate and careful as possible as you holster a live weapon. That's generally good advice for anywhere you find yourself specifically at a USPSA match as well. The next thing to be aware of is since you're not winning your first match out here, if any stage requires you to have downrange to uprange movement, meaning that you're not charging the targets, but you're running away from them, there's a number of different ways that you can accomplish it. The way that I would recommend to you for your first match is to just moonwalk. So you're just, if I'm pretending this way's uprange, I'm just gonna walk backwards, keep the gun pointed downrange. That's probably the way you're gonna wanna navigate it for your first match out. Finally, last piece of advice is do not buy anything unless you don't have equipment that's suitable. As far as iPro and EarPro is concerned, most of the ANSI Z87 Plus type eyewear that's used, you know, they sell it at Home Depot for like $5 or whatever. That's totally fine. The little foamy earplugs, that's gonna be fine as well. There's better stuff. I've got links to my favorite, you know, eye and ear pro down in the description. A hard-sided Kydex type holster is going to be acceptable. Do not run a leather holster and do not run a hybrid type holster. The leather can create some challenges at stuff getting inside the trigger guard when holstering. The holster should have a closed bottom so that it can't be be like pushed up through it like the Yaqui style type holsters or the slide type holsters are less optimum. But if you have a chair start where you sit down in a chair, you can have you know the muzzle of some long competition gun hit the chair and push up out of the holster and fall on the ground and that is a disqualifiable offense. A couple little kind of social things like this is a great way to meet a lot of people that you would never ever rub elbows with in the wider world. This is a volunteer sport. It takes volunteers to set up all the stages, to score the stages, to tear down the stages, figure out how you can get in and get involved in helping. That is the best way to meet new people because if you're building a stage together for 30 minutes to an hour before the match starts, you're gonna be talking to the people you're doing it with and it's an easy way to kind of make some contact and understand who's shooting with you and what's going on. It's, it's a really great sport with a lot of really cool people in it and being a volunteer is one of the best ways to meet people. And finally, we'll close with an administrative point is these matches generally take all day. Uh, if it's a six stage match, there's a good chance the amount of time from like when the match starts to when the match ends is gonna be the better part of about an hour per stage. Now it's gonna be less than that, but there's other stuff that you don't account for. Like sometimes there's a log jam on a stage or sometimes just the match starts late or whatever it is. So if you account from a time perspective, it's gonna take about an hour per stage that's gonna be probably the right amount of time. When the match is over, the scores are gonna be posted on practice score almost always. There's some weirdos who don't use practice score, but really practice score has become kind of the gold standard for scoring these matches. Be sure and check out part two of this video where we'll give you a couple like readiness t tests and some drills that you can do to see if you have the skill and some drills you can do to get ready for your first match. As always, I appreciate you guys and I'll catch you on the next one.